my name is Asker Beg Abrahamsen. I'm this guy on behalf of this uh, Beg Jensen, who could not be here, unfortunately. Um, I will tell you about a small thing now. Running a research project joined by uh, four different departments on the question, can we build a superconducting wind turbine generator for the future? We were sort of confronted with a very multidisciplinary task or uh, challenge in the research project. And at some point, we got the chance to try to say, can we actually build that into a three-week course? So this is a very compact teaching uh, uh, thing. Um, so this three-week course came about by the thing you've seen this morning, this green dust or quantum dust challenge that uh, Dean Martin was sort of uh, putting up. So he wanted to integrate to all students the thinking of sustainability in, in all projects. The way it was uh, sort of worked out is that there was an invitation to join this conference where the students should present a project on sustainability. Um, and they should do different things. Of, yeah, this is an outline of what I'm going to talk to talk, talk, uh, So why did we do this motivation for superconducting wind turbine generators? Um, but the, the, the output of this green uh, thing should be a poster, a video, then a public uh, showcase to a panel that would walk around at this Green Deuce conference. So there was actually a, a sort of representatives from, from the political parliament coming, walking around to each student's project, watching it and saying, I like this one. And at the end of it, that was a prize. Um, so I will just tell you how we, we, we did this, what experience we got from that, and sort of how we evaluated and on conclusions. I should say that the research project that we were running uh, or are running now is called Superwind. And uh, the motivation for this project, the following. The European Union has decided 20% of renewable energy in 20 years from now. If you calculate how many gigawatts of wind power we will need to fulfill this thing, you end up with numbers of the order 100 gigawatts. We are at four now in Europe. It means we have to install 100 gigawatts of wind turbine at sea if we have to fulfill these plans that are actually already uh, sort of uh, decided. Imagine we had a 10 megawatt turbine. We can divide this and say, well, that's 12,000 turbines we have to put somewhere. This is a map of the wind resources of Europe. Dark blue here is a good place to be. This stuff here is not a very good place to be. So you can see this is the UK are pushing wind power heavily. They have all the potentials. Denmark also have a quite good chance here. Now, this wind turbine park would be something looking like this if we put the turbines were sort of two kilometers apart. So it gives you a sense of how big is that European wind park we have to build. The generator that we need for doing this trick, the drivetrain that the Vestas uh, representative this morning was talking about, looks something like this. There's something that creates a magnetic field. This is being rotated by the turbine. Now, in order to figure out how much power do I get out of this wind turbine generator, we need to look a little bit how, what, what's inside. There will be a wire running around this magnetic part. And in this wire, I, I'm going to have a current. I can run through any light bulb or whatever I want to drop. At the end of the day, if you do the analysis, it turns out that there will be a torque on these wires. Torque times rotation, how much you move it. That to give the power. So the torque is going to be proportional to how powerful is the magnetic field, how much current can I have in this wire, and then basically what is the diameter of all these wires we're putting around it, then finally how long is the machine. So it all boils down to how strong the magnetic field, how strong the current, and the volume of the machine. So these are sort of the two things going into this equation, and then finally the rotation speed. Building offshore turbines, people are saying, let's get rid of the gearbox. It breaks down. We don't have any chance to, break, to, to change that in the middle of a winter storm. If we're taking the gearbox out, rotation speed falls down by a factor of 100. So in this equation, we have to do something with these numbers, find another factor of 100 to get the same power out. That can either be change the field, change the current density, or making the machine bigger. Um, Making the machines bigger is a complicated thing, because now you're at sea, you want to lift 500 tons up 100 meters. There's only a very few days you can do this. So one of the questions is, what happens to the magnetic field strength of these kind of machines? Now, the way we do it today, you take a copper wire, you wind it around some magnetic material. The issue is, 
Once you saturate all the small, small magnetic iron moments inside your iron, you don't get any more gain of having magnetic iron in such a machine. So once you get to 1 Tesla, 1.5 Tesla, that's your field limit. You can't get any more. The current density, that's basically just the toaster effect. It gets hot. So these two numbers are limited in a normal machine. So if you want to scale up your turbines, build the 10 megawatt, you will have to make the machine bigger. Now, aren't there tricks to do? Yes. Why don't we use permanent magnets? You heard uh, the Vestas uh, this morning commenting on this permanent magnet. You can do the, the f with permanent magnets. The issue is if you want to build a 10 megawatt machine, you need six tons of permanent magnet per turbine. Uh, you will have an issue of getting those magnets because 97% are made in, in, in China right now. Of course, you can say that's probably going to change. But this is definitely a challenge. Again, a permanent magnet contains iron. Once the iron moments are aligned, we get to a limit, 1.4, 1.5 Tesla. So the field limit is again limited, and the iron is again limiting our field strength. Now, what if I could turn that field strength to 2, 3, 4 Tesla? It would immediately turn into shrinking the size of the machine by the same factor, but I could get much more power out of it. So this is one of the things, or sort of the motivation. Could we use high temperature superconductors and create the magnetic field using the high temperature superconductors? And the good thing is they don't have any resistance, so you don't get any heating. You can turn up the field strength without boiling down your thing. Another thing is you would only need 10 kilos of this yttrium barium peroxide for a 10 megawatt machine. Now why is that? There's a new product coming out which is called a coated conductor. It looks like this. Maybe I should just pass it around. Um, it's basically a metal layer here, and then you put some ceramic layers on top of it, and then you put, at last, one micron thick ceramic layer of this uterium copper oxide ceramics. So a one micron thick layer, four millimeters wide, can carry 100 amps in that if you just dip it into liquid nitrogen. Um, it has to be cold sort of below 93 Kelvin before this uh, works. Um, and this is sort of what we've been working on in the Superwind project, where we've been doing coils, winding coils out of that wire into something that we believe could be the building block for generators or other devices. And we wanted to sort of, could we show the students this? And this was basically the motivation for, can we get them a feeling of the challenges of all doing all this stuff and make it work? Because it's not going to be easy. And you can't, well, you can call one company and try to buy this today. But uh, it will take some time before it's going it's to work. So what did we do? We wanted to have some lectures in the beginning of this three-week course. Something on wind power. I was telling this. I came, I'm coming from this national lab where we do a lot of wind power research. Uh, superconductivity, also know, something I know uh, of. But the physics department was giving some, some lectures on this. And then finite element uh, modeling from the, the mathematics department. So we gave the students a few lectures of, of this the first week. And then we were decided, or, or then we split into three groups. Uh, two students doing finite element simulations of a 10 megawatt permanent magnet generator. Two students doing the 10 megawatt superconducting. And then four students doing a demonstrator. Now, this was the demonstrator they did. We wanted to build a machine where they could actually see those wires in action. And finally, we had one student doing some mechanical stability down here. I'll come back to that later. At the last day of the three-week course, there should be a joint poster. All these groups should be decide on doing just one poster, presenting what they found, a live demonstration in front of this panel, and then the video was playing along with it. Uh, then we also needed to have some group reports. We needed to grade them. And, and we were deciding to do pass, not pass, because all the format of this content used was a little bit fuzzy at, at the time. So what you see here is the, the permanent magnet group is taking a permanent magnet, putting it here, having some copper windings here, and this is the magnetic structure sort of uh, supporting the whole thing. So they get to a result. 8.1 meter is the diameter of this big ring generator. We want to build this permanent magnet machine, 10 megawatt. The superconducting group uh, do it a little bit different. So now this kind of coil here is sitting uh, here, here, or you can see um, uh, this, is the, 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 this is where the magnetic field is strong in the middle of this. Structure. So there's one coil here, there's another coil here. And the result of the calculation shows you should be able to build a 5 meter 
meter superconducting generator producing 10 megawatts. Now, size matters a lot because now you also need to stabilize this structure and you need a lot of structural steel. We did not take that into account in, in, in these kind of calculations. Now, coming to this, the demonstrator, how do we do this? Well, take a dishwasher, you, you take it apart, you take out the stator, which is sort of the couple windings where you'll collect uh, the, 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 the current. This is where you'll put power for running your dishwasher pump. Then we sort of constructed this in the, the national lab and said we need to provide them with sort of the frame for, for making a superconducting winding. And then this would be the rotor part of a small test machine where we could let them play around with, uh, with these superconductors. So maybe I should just hand around this rotor. So what it contains of is basically this thing. A superconducting winding. So we take the tape. It was insulated. The students came up with taking the doctor's tape to do the electrical insulation. We were winding it around the, this uh, metal core or this uh, iron core, some two iron poles here. And then you see uh, we could have the current leads out. You actually had something you could power up directly in the lab. Um, now, this is the shaft, and we have some wire. You can actually probe what the superconductor is doing while, while the, the students are playing around with it. Okay, so let me just try to, to show you the demonstration video they actually managed doing at the end, so you can have a feeling of sort of what. So this is not getting dirty hands, but cold hands. So you see it moved quite much more dramatically than it did before. Yeah, so this is what they did. Uh, what it illustrated was, let's run the machine it was just running as a copper machine. One amp in the superconductor, one amp in the stator. But you saw that they could increase the current or the current all the way to 50 amps in the, in the superconducting rotor wind. So boosting the current density by a factor of 50. And when they actually went through sort of the calculations, they measured what is the, the magnetic field by having a small hole probe. You see these are hole probe uh, wires. So they could measure what is the magnetic field in our machine now when, once we run it superconducting. 
And they could also measure the torque, and, and it was maybe not that clear, but what they did was that they took the stick and put just a newton meter on it, and you can actually measure the torque of this machine. And what you see is the simulations. Those, the, the red ones, are actually the final element simulations that we had the students running here. So the previous point made by don't ever trust the computer model before you have validated it became very clear to these people or to these students. Um, OK, so evaluation, the positive thing, the negative suggestions. The students uh, enjoyed this because they, they joined it uh, sort of voluntarily, it was mandatory. Uh, eight out of nine had electrical machine background, so it was quite sort of biased, you can say. Um, saw that the visit to, to research as a national lab was a big in, environmental change for them and it was sort of said as to be good. It was um, interdisciplinary, uh, caused a much wider view on it and you can say you're challenging machine engineers quite a bit using these thought of superconductivity to them. It's really out of the box. Um, yeah, um, so negative. They said the communication between the three groups and then forming the poster was a pain, they thought. They wanted to sort of have tools on doing that, uh, sharing, sharing comments. Um, maybe this was a too homogeneous group. Um, and then they were complaining there was not, not enough space in one poster to present this thing. So suggestions, they want the tools, they wanted more guidance than that, but I guess this is all this working in groups. And then they wanted grades instead of not just having passed, not passed, because they did actually do a lot of work. And I think they deserved grades, but we were a little bit too unsure about the format of this green. Just so yeah, I think this is definitely what we want to do in the future. So just to give you some um, um, conclusions here. Uh, one thing I, yeah, how to evaluate this? How do you evaluate a video? What did you, what's the grade of that video you just saw? Uh, so we have some new products or some new uh, things coming out of, of this induced activity. How do, you, how do you evaluate an oral panel demonstration? They didn't win the prize. <laughs> so, but, okay, one thing I would just say is that we are actually doing research on this thing now. Because we were so inspired, inspired by the, the, the thing that, well, you know, to validate finite element simulations, and these are truly three-dimensional finite element simulations, because you can see it's a, it's a truly 3D machine. We were surprised about how much we learned from this exercise compared to what we do on our bigger machines. And uh, so, so I, I would say uh, the, the CDIO thinking might actually also benefit you from um, on the scientific point because you get inspired on how small a thing can I do my first sort of learning steps. Okay, so I think that will be the final word. Yeah.